Hello, and welcome to Pitt's Theology Library's Kessler Conversations, an opportunity to speak with leading scholars of the Reformation about the events in Europe in the 16th century and how they are relevant for communities today. My name is Bo Adams, and I serve as director of Pitt's Theology Library, part of Candler School of Theology here at Emory University. Our library is the home of the Richard C. Kessler Reformation Collection, a stunning collection of print books and manuscripts that document the Protestant Reformation and that also serve as the subject of research, exhibitions, and programs like this, which are our attempts to maximize the impact of these works. And our continued spring 2022 emphasis on women of the Reformation, I'm so pleased to be joined today by Dr. Elsie Ann McKee, Professor Emerita of Reformation Studies and History of Worship at Princeton Theological Seminary. Professor McKee is a world-renowned scholar celebrated widely for her contributions to our understanding of events in Europe in the 16th century. Most notable is her work on the reformer John Calvin, known best through her acclaimed trilogy on Calvin's doctrines on the worship of the church, which include John Calvin and the diaconate and liturgical almsgiving, elders and the plural ministry, and the pastoral ministry and worship in Calvin's Geneva. Professor McKee has also been at the forefront of discovering, examining, and celebrating women's voices in the Reformation, most significantly through her work on Katharina Schutzel. A through line of her scholarship and teaching has been making connections between the past and the present, something I think you'll clearly see in today's conversation and an effort that I think makes her a perfect guest for us today. She joins us to talk on the conversation on the topic, Surprise and Diversity, A Woman's Place in Reform Yesterday and Today. So Professor McKee, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. I want to remind our guests who are with us today that they too can also participate. So as Professor and I, uh, McKee and I talk, if you have questions or comments for her, please feel free to type them in the Q&A section on the right side of the screen. And as we have time at the end, I will relay these questions to her. And your comments and, co and questions are always so helpful in these conversations. So Professor McKee, let's just get started. Your work, of course, is explicitly about recovering lost voices, specifically the voices of women, and, and both in the past in Europe, but also in the present, most notably in Africa. So I'm curious, as we get started on this topic of women, what is often the response you get, particularly from students, as you introduce them to voices that they may not be familiar with? Thank you for that question. There are three surprises or questions which come up every time I teach about women in the Reformations or women in modern African Christianity. The first surprise is there are so many of them. They are active, vocal, participating with their contemporaries. Some are more identifiable as specific figures, as women who have left some kind of distinctive marks in the records. More are visible because they voted with their feet, sharing actively in the religious upheavals of their own day. Remember, even those who remained in communion with Rome experienced noticeable changes in their ways of being devout. A woman in the 15th century did not live in the same Roman church as her descendant in the 17th century. A scholarship about women has expanded. More and more of the millions of women of the past have become visible, at least in collective terms, and sometimes in their own words and actions. And that leads to the second big surprise. They were not all the same. It's amazing and delightful to learn something of the wide range of women's lives and engagements with their world. There are many things they had in common, of course, but there was much more variety among them than we would at first expect. There were different cultural contexts in early modern Europe. We know that, but we don't realize how much it matters until we learn that where a girl was born could predict fairly well when she would marry and what her married home would be like. In some places, teenage girls were married to older men and lived in their husband's home in power. In some places, bride and groom were both in their teens and lived in his parents' household under that older generation's power. In some places, both members of the couple were in their mid-twenties and set up their own household. And then, of course, there were different levels of education depending again on family and geography. Was the girl daughter of a humanist who had no sons, so he taught her instead? Was the girl a peasant in a rural area where no one in her family, perhaps no one in her village, could read? 
This points also to the more obvious socioeconomic differences. And of course, confessional differences, but I'll come back to that. And Reformation was not just in Europe. A year ago, when I was teaching this class, my dear friend and colleague, Professor Haruko Nawata Ward of Columbia Seminary, brought us the most moving Lenten story of the thousands of Japanese Christian martyrs, among them many amazing women like Susanna, who was tortured for months. One part of that was crucifying her by tying her spread eagle to a tree in the winter forest, putting her naked baby Maria at her feet and leaving them in the snow for eight hours on Christmas Eve. And there is the intense asceticism of Keteri Takakwitha, the Native American whose dying converted her Jesuit confessor to recognizing this young woman on the far edges of his world as a saint. And the charismatic prophet Donna Beatrice Kempavita, who believed that Saint Anthony was speaking through her as she called her people in war-torn Congo to that spiritual and national renewal they needed. The third question is, why did they stop short? Why did they not reject patriarchy? When my students meet these incredible women of whom they had never heard, they're delighted and also disappointed. Why did these women not go all the way to demand equality? This is where we have to remember that each person lives in a particular time and place. And what each person sees and is able to imagine is grounded in that world. These women did in fact reject patriarchy in many ways. They were often more radical for their day than we are in ours, but their day was different from ours. To understand any history, her story, their story, we have to suspend our own assumptions about the world and try to get inside their worldview. Just think back to our grandparents or great grandparents experience. What was living through the 1918 flu pandemic like? How different is our experience of COVID? For our ancestors, wherever they were in the world, the flu was something to be endured without any of the modern medical aids. Communications were so limited that someone might die without anyone else knowing. There were virtually no essential workers to keep food coming. My grandmother in Congo wrote of spending all day over a big kettle of soup, trying desperately to provide at least something for the families around her who were sick and dying. I, it, it's so uh, enlivening to hear you talk about the diversity of these contexts and the hard work that needs to go in in order to understand each of these women in her particular context. Because while there are similarities between these contexts, there are vast differences and it's so important to introduce that nuance to the conversation. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to doing that as we, as we move forward here. Now you mentioned some of your work uh, connecting the work you've done in the 16th century to different contexts. And in particular, you've done a lot of work connecting it to the African context in the 21st century. Um, you note in a recent essay, and I'll just quote you here, in some ways it is a big jump to move from 16th century Europe to 21st century Africa, but Christian women in Africa have many things in common with Christian women of earlier times. So I'm fascinated about this big jump, and I'm hoping you can help us understand, A, how to make this big jump in particular from 16th century Europe to 21st century Africa, but how do we approach moving between contexts and trying to draw connections between different contexts? It's a great question and far beyond what I can do, but I'm gonna make an effort. In some ways, the surprises are the same, in some ways different. My students are amazed. There are so many of them. Here, I can only give a few names. Wangari Matai, Mercy Amba Odoyoye, Malala Yousafzai, Esther Bu, Lima Geboye, Boy Hong Ting, Niambora Njiroje, Musimbi Kanyoro, Jung Suk Lee, Mama Monique Senga Mukuna, and more and more. And many are known only in their own their communities, like Mianda Ernestine, Henriette Nzeyi, Janet Woto, Antoinette Bulaka, and more. And they are not all the same. 
They come from many different languages and cultures. Even within the Democratic Republic of Congo, which I know best personally, there are many different languages and ethnic traditions. They come from different religious communities. They come from many different ways of life. Rural subsistence farming, which is backbreaking work. Or small businesses, like making donuts to sell on the street. If you don't sell them, you don't eat. Or teaching other girls and women to read and write and create income generating projects. Or even serving in the military or earning places in higher education or government service. For all of them, as for their sisters in earlier ages, they face many of the same challenges in trying to feed and clothe and educate their children and achieve some kind of better world for their people. For most of them, as for their Reformation sisters, their faith is the backbone of their struggle. And why did they stop short? By now that should be easier to answer. What was possible for them in their circumstances? What could they imagine? It's important to remember that the global South is full of a great deep diversity of cultures, much more different among themselves than the cultures of 16th century Europe were. But there are also some similarities because until fairly recently, in most societies in the global South, traditional ways had a stronger influence than innovations. One thing about the 21st century is that cultural change is happening at a much more rapid rate than in the 16th century, for better or worse. Sometimes it's for the better and sometimes it's not. New ideas may cross cultural boundaries more easily now, but access to wider perspectives has always been uneven. Many people, especially those who have been marginalized as long as anyone can remember, are hesitant to challenge authorities. The consequences for doing so can be deadly. Yet some do, and they work to share what they have learned. Thank you so much. I mean, I just saw a comment we had about sharing that incredible list of names that you, you enumerated there, and we will certainly uh, share those with our audience because it's incredible to know how many people that to me are so unfamiliar, but often uh, have such incredible stories to tell and, and, and your ability to tie those stories to, together is just so lovely. I want to pause here and ask, uh, if I can, a moment of, of your own biography. You've, you've alluded a couple of times to your own connection to the Congo. So I suspect that's how you started to make these connections between your historical work and contemporary context. But can you tell us a little bit about what got you interested in these modern contexts? Thank you very much. I am a Congolese by birth and even by ancestry. My grandparents went to Congo in 1911, and my father and his siblings were born and grew up there. We are, they were uh, American uh, Presbyterian Christians who went to teach and preach the gospel as they understood it. And the world that they uh, encountered was in many ways very receptive. Most people in Congo now, maybe 80%, understand themselves to be Christian. How they learned it was from each other. The handful of Americans uh, who came to Congo just brought seeds, and then other people took the seeds and planted them and took them back to their own villages. So I grew up in a world that was all Black, and my church was all Black, and that was the world I knew and valued. I didn't realize as a small child that there were multiple languages. I knew that I spoke to certain people in different ways. So for me, the, the world of Central Africa is home. And it's one of my great del delights to try to bridge the space between my childhood world and my adult world in the States and to help them get to know each other better. Well, and your own story and your own career, I think, speaks volumes to the value of experiencing other cultures, of broadening one horizon, and how important that can be, particularly in our American context, where so often we are so centrally focused on, you know, our Western context and, and um, how that informs the, the work we do. Um, I'm curious, you, you talked a little bit about um, change and, and our, our expectation of why these women didn't push against systems. 
One of the things that our collection tends to document or focus on in the 16th century context are changes that did happen in the 16th century. And as you mentioned, they were slower than the cultural and religious changes that we're seeing today. But if we can kind of move back to the 16th century quickly, can you talk a little bit about some of the reform or change in that context and how, what influence that had or effect that had on women and their roles in society? Great. Yes. The religious and theological changes which women experienced are sometimes among the better known aspects of their lives, at least in academic or church circles, but they're actually much more complex than we have usually been told. Everyone knows that a whole society is experiencing a cultural uh, change when there are people uh, preaching and publishing in new ways. Uh, and these ways that the women shared in this wider range of experience in various ways. These were shaped by their confession, or we might say the church or denomination to which they belonged. Uh, but one big dividing issue, which caused a lot of change, could be put as to marry or not to marry. Uh, that's very oversimplified, of course, uh, because there were all kinds of factors which made it impossible for a girl to choose for herself. But there were different ideals, and that's where one of the big changes comes. For centuries, uh, to be celibate, a virgin or a widow, was regarded as the most holy life. And in Roman Catholic circles, in the Reformations, that ideal gained new fervor, though it was also somewhat altered itself by the addition of the idea that nuns were not simply to withdraw from the world, in some ways to be actively engaged in ministry to the ignorant, the poor, and the sick. It was kind of hard to make that work, but that was an important change for Roman Catholic uh, celibate ideal. Protestants broke with the celibate ideal entirely and replaced it with the ideal of marriage as the proper vocation for men and women, at least by and large, there were exceptions. Women had traditionally been equated with sexual temptation and marriage with a lower form of Christian life. Changing the idea of married uh, life, sexuality, to be the primary form of Christian vocation meant that women's ordinary lives were seen in a more positive perspective. On the other hand, women also lost the possibility of a recognized holy lifestyle style outside of marriage. At the time, the most shocking aspect of this reversal was that clergy, and they were all male, were now expected to be married. We don't realize what a shock that was. Protestants created the new role model of pastor's wife. However old hat that might sound in the 21st century, it was groundbreaking in the 16th century. One other thing that we often don't think of, women's voices had not been heard in worship. Protestants introduced congregational singing following the, the Hussites. And this caused quite a scandal in some circles. Women were not supposed to be heard in church, and that meant they were only supposed to sing at home in their closets. Nope. Protestants said women sing in church along with the men. But in, and we spoke last month with uh, Mary Jane Hamig about Elizabeth Kruziger, a woman who actually wrote hymns uh, for Christian worship. So um, quite, a, quite a change in the role. I'm, I'm curious, um, we tend to speak about the Protestants or the Protestant Reformation. Um, I presume there was diversity in terms of the roles of women across the various reforming movements. Is that correct? In good measure, yes, but also it varied most significantly between Roman Catholic and uh, those who broke with Rome. Mm -hmm. There was much more variety among those who broke with Rome, though there was also still significant variety among the Roman Catholics uh, and the new religious orders of women uh, which wanted to engage in things like nursing ministries or working with uh, street children girls. Uh, but among the Protestants, there was a wider scope, but in some ways it was not as expansive as we might in the uh, 21st century think uh, it would be good to see, because most people then as now are concentrated on survival. 
so the outstanding voices are the ones that can't be considered really typical, though they also can sh they show what is possible. That yeah, that that makes good sense. And I'm I'm so I'm curious. I'm I'm always interested in talking to, to people like you who, on the one hand, you're trained as a historian and you you study the past, and yet you've spent much of your career teaching in a seminary context, presumably to students who are asking, what relevance does the past have for the present? Right? Why should I learn this kind of stuff? Certainly, it's interesting, but what what impact does it have? So as you kind of look back on your Reformation era scholarship, what, what lessons from the 16th century do you draw for the 21st century, particularly as it relates to amplifying the voices and diversifying the roles that are available for women? So how does the studying the past really help us in the present? Absolutely. Most important question in some ways that a historian ever um, approaches, because you assume that most students in your classes think history is bunk. Uh, so how do we go about changing that or offering another perspective. There are actually many important insights we can gather from the past for, for living more fully and more wisely today. Even if you forget all of the information that you'd earn in the class, what you do remember, I hope, is the complexity and the idiosyncratic character of the fact that people live in different times and places and come from different perspectives. I guess one thing that can really make a difference is what I might call cultural humility, applied over space or over time. The best way to learn about and live with the wonderful and amazing diversity of people is to begin by listening with an open mind. That means considering them worth our attention and then letting them guide the conversation as much as possible. In order to make sense of women in the Reformation, we must be interested first. And secondly, we need to expect them to surprise us by being different from us as well as similar to us. For me, crossing centuries or crossing geography is exciting because it introduces me to people who are so wonderfully not just like me. Of course, I really value finding things that these people have in common with me, but my understanding of the world is stretched and enriched by encountering and considering the implications of their differences. That makes me a bigger and I think a wiser person. It equips me better to see the people around me. If I can learn to listen to people who can't talk back, then maybe I can be a better listener for the people around me. That's so wonderfully put. I think this idea of cultural humility and listening is obviously a value that we've in, in some cases lost and I think something we really need to work uh, to recover. In that vein, if I can ask about some specific stories that you've uncovered. Uh, one thing that's great about your scholarship is that you don't talk only in generalities, you talk in specificity. And you've already mentioned a number of women in particular can you tell us some stories of some of your favorite, whether they're 16th or 21st century, to kind of illuminate some of these principles or these ideas that you've been talking about? Great to bring my two best friends, one from the past and one from the global south. I know them very well because I have been privileged to help them get their stories into print. Katharina Schützel, born about 1498 in Strasbourg, was one of the very first pastor's wives and a powerful voice in her own right. Unlike most of the women who left writings, she was not a nun or an aristocrat. She was a middle-class woman, literate in her own German language, but not educated in Latin. She was very devout from childhood, but never felt assured of her salvation until she heard the new parish priest, Matthew Zell. He was preaching what we would call the Protestant insights, which he had learned from Martin Luther. Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone. And she was off and running. She married Zell to demonstrate the authority of scripture over canon law, and she set herself to be a fisher of people. She welcomed refugees and spoke out against prejudice, helping the least of these in many very practical ways. 
She also wrote and taught because she thought that they needed to know the faith rightly. She produced expositions of the Lord's Prayer and some Psalms. She preached a burial sermon for her husband, which called on the congregation to keep the faith. She published a hymn book for women and children, a kind of teach yourself catechism book for families. She wrote pastoral letters to people in trouble and most scandalous, polemical and historical text to defend her husband and the first generation of reform when they were being maligned in the next generation. She was both compassionate and courageous, a really remarkable person. I'm glad she wasn't my mother. I would never have lived up to her expectations. I can't say more now, but invite you to read her story and especially her own writings. My other best friend is Monique Misanga Mukuna, affectionately known as Mama Monique, one of the most amazing Christians I have ever met. She is a Presbyterian laywoman in the Democratic Republic of Congo. She had the unusual opportunity to get a good education all the way through university because her father had taken to heart the teaching that girls are worth as much as boys, very untraditional in Congo. One of Mama Monique's favorite verses is Genesis 1:27. God created them male and female in God's image. She not only learned to care for herself and her relatives, but she has spent most of her life looking out for the vulnerable, victims of violence, especially gender violence, victims of endemic poverty, especially young girls and orphans and elderly widows and people living with HIV AIDS. She has done this through her church and through the ecumenical women's nonprofit, which she and friends founded in 1999. The French name Femme Verso de l'Abondance translates as Woman Cradle of Abundance. She's also been active in international peacemaking missions uh, in Rwanda and the Ivory Coast, as well as working with refugees and displaced persons from wars closer at hand. Let me tell just two stories. For most of Mama Monique's life, Congo was a military dictatorship. Soldiers were everywhere, and in the 60s and 70s, it was not uncommon for them to set up barriers on roads and stop all the traffic. In 1972, when, she, when the young Monique was returning home from university, her transport truck was stopped at one of these barriers, and the soldiers prepared to take what they wanted from the people's possessions. Monique was having none of this. At just 20, she refused to cooperate with the soldiers. Their commander was astonished and berated her. And she answered that the military head of the government, General Mobutu, had forbidden these military checkpoints. And she managed to overawe the commander and his soldiers. And they let the people go. The passengers thought she was absolutely crazy until she saved them. When she became an adult, Mama Monique extended that help to many, many others, like Kenge. Kenge was an orphan living with an uncle. When he died, she had no means of support. Relatives said that she should become a barmaid, which was shorthand for prostitute. She hated the whole idea. She found Mama Monique, who welcomed her and enrolled her in the nonprofit's sewing school so that she could learn to support herself with dignity. Mama Monique has been doing similar things all her life. You will love her story, Cradling Abundance, one African Christian's story of empowering women and fighting systemic poverty. There are lots of close calls of this courageous woman, uh, other people with guns that she has defied, as well as incredible stories of her compassion and wisdom, enabling the most marginalized to find new life and dignity, and stories of many of her colleagues, because she works with women, not just for them. Wow. Well, I, I could sit and hear stories all day long. So thank you for sharing those, which is just a few. I, I encourage you, uh, as Professor McKee did, to read more. And of course, we will prepare a bibliography where you can, in fact, read more uh, about uh, these incredible women, their stories, and you can hear how well Professor McKee uh, tells these stories. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Now, I 
typically in these conversations, I ask a very self-serving library question, and I'm still going to ask that question, which is to, to have you reflect on the value of libraries. We, of course, are a rare book library. We spend a lot of time and energy collecting materials from the 16th century. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the value of the library. But more broadly, I suspect library and research for you is a little bit different than just sitting in a library. So if you could also expand that to talk a little bit about how do you conduct this research? How do you get to know these stories? How do you get to know these women? Thank you very much. Libraries and archives are my favorite places. I, I go settled into an archive and I can just feel myself relaxing and getting into that wonderful 16th century dust. They're treasure houses for hungry minds and the most amazing sources for detective work. The only thing about my childhood in Congo which felt like a deprivation was the lack of libraries. Hmm. All of our wonderful new friends like Katarina Schutzel essentially come from libraries and archives. And understanding Mon Monique's world is possible because of libraries. But as you say, it is also uh, a, there are other ways of learning. And I have spent most of my life in libraries, in archives. But as I have reached out to see what would be helpful in my students learning about the world, I've realized that a lot of the stories that they would benefit from hearing are not written down. They're stories that are still being lived and acted out. And so you have to meet those people. One of the things that I did while I was teaching uh, in Women in African Christianity course was to organize a conference uh, called, I called it the All Conference, African Women Extraordinaire. Uh, and we invited um, keynote speakers, uh, major figures to bring their words, their stories to campus. And we had all kinds of local voices joining in. And usually that was the high point of the semester for the students because they got to see and hear and ask their own questions and discover these are real people. And we can learn all kinds of things from them. So the ways of uh, expanding our knowledge of women include making the acquaintance of people who are our, our contemporaries. I will have to say it's a different form of research for me. This is the first time I had ever done what someone might call oral history. And it was fairly challenging, but I had years and years of times when I visited Mama Monique or she visited me to tape her story and then transcribe it and translate it. And she checked everything, helped me with editing, all of those kinds of things. But it's a different kind of process. It's one that people can undertake with the outstanding figures in their own communities. Think about the stories that will be lost if we don't know. And who's going to tell them? The people who are listening. We are the ones listening. Think of the amazing people that you know. Wouldn't you love to be able to share their stories? I think that's so lovely put. I, I, I will, for my library friends, I will encourage us that the library is still a central part of that research, right? If, if our mission is about yes. preserving, and we tend, we tend to think about that as preserving old books, that same mission is alive and well when we talk about preserving the stories that may not ever be written down. Um, and as you and I were reflecting before this conversation, one of the benefits of technologies, it, sometimes technologies get in the way, but they also can facilitate this kind of thing. And so yes. you and I may not have to meet up in an airport to have this conversation. We can have it online. Likewise, you and Mama Monique can probably continue a conversation without mm -hmm. having travel uh, in the way. So. Um, yes, I think you, you've given us all a um, an encouragement to uh, to expand our notion of what research and preservation uh, may be, and I think oral history is a, a big part of that. So thank you for that. I want to, I mean, in, in the vein of talking about resources, I we've had a couple of questions come through, and it, and it's always an interest of mine that you uh, offer our audience other resources that they can learn from, and of course, your work is the primary, and we will distribute that. But if, you, if you're someone who's interested more in women of the 16th century or the 21st century, as you've described, are there sources that you would point uh, people to uh, that may have a low barrier to entry, but that may help them kind of learn a little bit more about what you've been talking about? 
very good question. Uh, there are actually more and more resources in our day and age um, for learning about Reformation women. One of the places I would suggest starting is a series published by the University of Chicago called The Other Voice in Early Modern Europe. These are good translations of 16th century women's voices, and it gives you the opportunity to meet them in person uh, in a better uh, context than just little snippets here and there. And there's similar collections, more of them, for English language women, you, as you might expect. Some of them are a little bit harder of access, like the early modern English woman, a facsimile library of essential works. That's because these are the actual prints of the text that 16th century women published in England. They're a little harder to read, but it is actually quite fascinating. One of my students took it as her uh, project to transcribe that into uh, English uh, text that we could read more easily because she thought it was such a wonderful prayer book. Uh, there are quite a number of one volume introductions and you can find them in many places. Um, these are increasingly adding lesser known figures to the ones who are uh, already uh, becoming more visible. So that getting to be encyclopedias kind of women. These are usually much shorter presentations, but they give you a, a fascinating overview of the people who were, some of the people who were there. One of them that will be coming out in the fall, which is edited by your next guest, uh, is Women Reformers of Early Modern Europe. One of the neat things about it is that it gives a short excerpt from the women's writings, as well as a, an introduction to them. And especially it includes uh, Scandinavian uh, figures and some Eastern European ones who have not been known before. Reformation era women also appear in volumes organized by topic. Uh, such as the Handbook of Women Biblical Interpreters. If you want to find out uh, what women have been writing about the Bible, you may be quite surprised. For the African women, one key place to look is the writings of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians. These are not a series. The, this is a, a kind of a group of women, uh, educated women, who have written on a whole variety of subjects and if you look for the name Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians, you will find a, a wide diversity of the kinds of writings, uh, short uh, articles, uh, longer studies of things like polygamy or other things, uh, ritual and women's uh, medicine, a whole variety of subject matters. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and I'll remind our audience, we will distribute a bibliography that mentions all of these sources. I, I go back to one of the responses you had before, and that was, there are so many of them. I think oftentimes we may assume, oh, it's, it's women from the past. There weren't many sources that survived. But in fact, there are so many, but we're indebted to people like you who've done the hard work of discovering them, of editing them and translating them and now making them available. And I think it, we're at a very exciting time. And I suppose you would agree Mm -hmm. that this stuff is really starting to become more available uh, to us all, both the 16th century as well as the 21st century voices. Um, so thank you for sharing all of those sources. As we draw near to our time, uh, I want to thank you primarily for your work and, and, and the, the leadership that you've shown in bringing these voices to the fore and, and to inviting us to share in these wonderful stories, uh, but also for the time that you spent with us uh, here today. Um, we will uh, work quickly to get this talk online so that those who couldn't join us live uh, will be able to do so. Um, and I wanna remind you that this is just one of three conversations that we are um, having this semester. Um, and we have already had last month, we had Professor Mary Jane Hamig join us and talk about a specific woman from the 16th century, uh, Elizabeth Krusiger. And then we will have uh, Kirsty Stern on next month, whom you just mentioned is editing this forthcoming volume. Mm -hmm. um, all of these are available at pitts.emory.edu slash Kessler Conversations, as well as our entire back catalog of these conversations. So Professor McKee, on behalf of all of our guests today, um, thank you so much uh, for your work and for joining us. For those of you who joined us, thank you for participating in this. And I look forward to seeing you, you at next event. Uh, and in the meantime, please stay safe. And uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you all.